overwhelming degree, the pursuit of equality has largely played out as a struggle between minority or marginalized groups and a majority or dominant group. Bigotry is informed by difference and by demographics. Whether French Arabs or Caribbean Brits or Black Americans, their status as minority groups in their home nations is a key factor in their marginalization. Of course, it's not always a majority-minority relationship. We just need to look at the disadvantage that women have suffered at the hands of patriarchy. Another instance where it is not a majority-minority relationship that produces demands for equality is one in which we have a state of ethnic conflict. Such was the case in the former Yugoslavia, in Lebanon, um, and to a lesser degree in the Ukraine. Of course, such was also the case in Northern Ireland. Equality and discrimination will factor into ethnic conflicts in many ways. Unequal treatment on the basis of ethnicity, unequal cultural recognition, maldistribution, misrepresentation, and so on, all of these will play out when we have a state of ethnic conflict. As it so often does, difference leads to misunderstanding, provoking the antagonism that ultimately yields deepening forms of inequality. Ethnic conflict is presented as a genuinely universal relationship of rivalry between competing groups. Another view, however, describes ethnic conflict as a tool of elites. Not necessarily an experience of the masses, but one in which grievances, legitimate grievances, are exploited, are manipulated, and presented with an intrinsically ethnic dimension. The essentialization of ethnic elements and the essentialization of ethnic demands results in the exacerbation of ethnic conflict, prolonging divisions, deepening rivalries. Proponents of the second view present the alleged conflict between Islam and European or American society as evidence of elite manipulation. Centuries of peaceful coexistence are glossed over in favor of an essentialist narrative of duality, difference, and rivalry. Of course, the truth is not nearly as polarized and hints of both representations of ethnic conflict are quite common. Socioeconomic inequalities that are perceived as group experiences can quickly lead to ethnic-based political mobilization. In turn, this mobilization can be capitalized upon and translated into an identity-centric issue, often smothering the socioeconomic elements that provoked the dispute at the outset. Under these circumstances, the meaning of equality blurs. Victims of inequality come to see their victimization as ethnic oppression, resulting in a surge of ethno-nationalism that can quickly devolve into ethno-chauvinism. How then to pursue equality when caught up in an oppositional ethnic framework? Let us consider the question through the lens of Northern Ireland. Since the early 80s, Catholics and nationalists have expressed grievances about substantive communal inequality across Northern Ireland. Having been backed by empirical evidence, these grievances were taken into consideration in the shaping of the Good Friday Agreement, setting out a vision for a new beginning in Northern Ireland. This new beginning transcended many fields of Northern Irish society, including criminal justice, decommissioning, and of course, equality and rights. While sanctioning British sovereignty over Northern Ireland, Irish self-determination was also affirmed in the Good Friday Agreement, though it was qualified. Nationalists may aspire to Irish unity, but not to territorial reunification. The Good Friday Agreement placed Northern Ireland in a distinct constitutional position that stretches beyond the frame of this lecture. What is of interest are the series of measures designed to ensure proportionality in representation 
across the assembly and the executive, measures which both directly and indirectly present the two groups, Catholic and Protestant, as distinct from one another. In addition to adapting political institutions, domestic legislation was used to create an even playing field between nationalists and unionists. Of course, the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and the Good Friday Agreement has hardly played out as anticipated. First, peace walls separating Catholic and Protestant communities have spread. Second, communal segregation is on the rise. Third, we see also spikes in intercommunal violence. A desire for proportionality and equality in representation has morphed into a perverse form of autonomous and even antagonistic cohabitation. Indeed, one of the chief criticisms of the Good Friday Agreement is the freezing of communal identities and, by extension, the exacerbation of ethno-nationalism. Consequently, critics argue that equality legislation has been used primarily to split the spoils, so to speak, rather than to establish a more equitable, a more united society. Supporters of the agreement, for their part, argue that the Good Friday Agreement was a pragmatic approach towards mediating a conflict between two groups who identify as Catholic and Protestant, or Irish and British, first, rather than as Northern Irish. Stated otherwise, within an ethnic conflict, the best to be hoped for is a level of formal, possibly even substantive equality informed by a separate but equal doctrine. To return to our original question, how to pursue equality when caught up in an oppositional ethnic framework? The answer is unclear, but critics of the Good Friday Agreement pointing to increases in divisions, increases in peace walls, rising um, ethnic communal tension, have suggested that codifying ethnic divisions in legislation is an ill-advised strategy. Other arguments have also been made that suggest that legislation which acknowledges ethnic divisions are in fact not the source of ethnic tension in Northern Ireland. First, political institutions do not freeze identities since the law is only one element, one factor in identity formation. Everyday activities, everyday social relations will bear a greater responsibility or greater impact on the forms of self-identification than law ever could. It would be better to look at ethnic representation in housing or employment or education rather than among political elites when assessing the success or failure of ethnic integration. Second, legislation is less important than critics and supporters suggest for the operation of institutions depends less on formal rules than on informal relations. This has been observed in many institutions in as many jurisdictions that often operate in ways quite distinct from what is set out in policy. The same is apparent in Northern Ireland, where public attitudes are not what they once were, even if elite representation remains quite rivalrous. Third, even the possible failure of representative institutions should be understood as part of a wider agreement. By integrating most social institutions, equality legislation has resolved many long-standing inequalities, creating new opportunities for both Catholics and Protestants alike. It's not all peaches and cream, to be sure, but it certainly isn't the 1970s or even the 1980s. The results of equality legislation, including the Fair Employment Act 1989 and including the objectives laid out in the Good Friday Agreement, are nothing short of remarkable. In 1971, while they made up 30% of the economically active population, Catholics only represented 14% of professionals and only 8% of the top 250 civil service jobs. By 2001, 30 years later, while Catholics came to represent 40% of the economically active population, their representation in professions had increased dramatically, 
43% of professionals and over 30% of the top civil service jobs. By 2005, the police service was recruiting both Protestants and Catholics equally. Irish language provisions, including educational opportunities and street signs, were also institutionalized. None of this is to suggest that perfect parity has been achieved. Catholics are still twice as likely to be unemployed. However, Catholic perception of their collective situation has changed dramatically also. In 1968, 74% believed they were discriminated against. In 2000, this number was down to 20%. If we recall our earlier lecture on proactive measures, remind you of a warning. It is easy to get caught up in the strategy when, from an equality perspective, outcomes are far more significant. In this instance, ethnically based legislative intervention appears to have produced much in the way of equality. Every coin has two sides, and of course the gains by the Catholic side has often been viewed as a loss by the Protestant side. The sense of disadvantage manifests in much tension between the groups as steps are taken to preserve Protestant freedoms, often at the expense of Catholic neighbors. For instance, the prohibition on Protestant marches in Catholic neighborhoods was met by the Glenburn protest, in which Protestants tried to prevent Catholic schoolgirls from walking to school through their neighborhoods. To prevent perceived gains by one ethnic group, another ethnic group may seek to deepen ethnic segregation as the basis of an equal relationship. How widespread these segregationist sentiments are is unclear. Flag marches, for instance, enjoy important support some days and virtually none on others. Moreover, in a 2007 survey, only a minority of people declared self-identifying as exclusively Irish or exclusively British, suggesting that integration has produced a change in self-perception across both communities as many Protestants and Catholics now identify as Northern Irish. If we return to our original question, how then to pursue equality when caught up in an oppositional ethnic framework? The answer seems to be that equality legislation informed by parity in ethnic representation across both political and social institutions can be effective in redressing inequalities in societies that are denoted by rivalrous conflict, by rivalrous ethnic divisions. While this may seem to contradict our initial conclusion, recall what we said earlier that the answer depends largely on the yardstick that we are applying. And in this instance, we have simply adjusted that yardstick. To conclude, a blend of equality motivated statutes, including the Good Friday Agreement, have restructured Northern Irish society and redressed some of the most blatant forms of inequality between Catholics and Protestants. Both political and social institutions are now more representative of the two major ethnic groups than they were just a few decades ago. Integration has spread, with both groups now self-identifying neither exclusively as Irish or British, but as Northern Irish, having adopted a hybrid identity. And we've seen a drop in reports of discrimination from Catholics. Despite these impressive results, many divisions persist and some have even intensified. Part of this has to do with the essentialization of ethnic categories and the emphasis this places on difference. By shining a bright light on ethnicity, public attitudes towards the other harden sometimes producing greater antagonism between the groups. As these groups come to constitute their political identities in oppositional ways, egalitarianism comes to resemble segregation or a separate but equal model. Much of this has to do with the history of Northern Ireland and of societies marred in ethnic conflict. The aim of the Good Friday Agreement was never to create a unitary state or a binational order identity. 
but to redress some of the worst grievances of the parties. This was considered a first step. The belief was, the belief is, that in time, a mollification of the grievances will result in the emergence of a communal identity and possibly even a participatory, a unitary polity. Whether this is on the horizon remains to be seen. Thank you. Thank you.